to for just a moment.
theme this morning, as you should quickly realize, is shine. Uh, how Jesus shines, and uh, Pastor Sherman will, will lead us there as well. So I want to invite you to stand and join with us in, in singing, um, continuing in worship. Uh, hymn 491, Shine, Jesus, Shine. John 8, uh, 12 says, I am the light of the world. Jesus is our light. Shine, Jesus, shine.
light shine out of the darkness. May his light shine in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Heavenly Sunlight, hymn number 489. We'll sing all three stanzas. Heavenly Sunlight.
sing uh, Blaze, Spirit Blaze. And our Sunday school class actually this morning was in Acts chapter 2 about the, the Spirit coming in like a mighty rushing wind. And what it's like to have that combination of wind and fire of tongues. It, it ignites, it explodes. Uh, it's this blaze. Uh, and from that blaze, uh, we're able to hear the word and to have Jesus touch us. The question is, have you let Jesus touch you this morning? As we stand to sing hymn number 628, He Touched Me. Thank you. 
Children can be dismissed for Children's Church. John chapter 8, verses 12 through 22. I want to speak to you about Jesus, the light of the world. I want to remind you that when this takes place, Jesus had already been teaching in the temple. He taught that he was the water of life. He was the bread of life. And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees set up this thing where a woman was caught in adultery. They bring to Jesus to try to trip him up. He deals with that the, the way that only God can deal with it. And everything works out. And now he comes to this, and immediately on the heels of them walking away in shame, he makes the statement, I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I want to remind you, if we are honest with ourselves, we must admit that we live in a very, very spiritually dark world. And even though it may not seem like it to us, lost people in desperation are seeking the truth. They just don't know that they're seeking the truth. The real problem is that they're spiritually blind and they're trapped by what Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 calls unfruitful deeds of darkness. And that's our world that we live in today. Proverbs 2.13 tells us, Those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, it says that they will walk in darkness and they will stumble. This is the world that Jesus came into. This is a world that we live into today. It's a world that's stained by sin, but Jesus being the light of the world is the only means by which you and I will not stumble and wind up being destroyed. I want you to take notice very soon after Jesus had made that declaration, when he says, I am the light of the world, and he that followeth after me will not walk in darkness, but shall walk in the light of life. The religious leaders immediately challenged Jesus by calling him a liar. Jesus quickly responds with another truth. Though I bear a record of myself, yet I am true, or my record is true, my testimony is true. Even though it's mine, he says, it's true. And even though they continued slandering Jesus, he continued with what you might call infinite patience. And he demonstrated to them the love of God and the grace of God by giving them more and more truths. Think about it for a moment. There was a true light of the world who had stepped out of eternity and stepped into time. And he was offered an invitation to come out of the darkness for those who, if they would simply follow the teachings of Christ, would be able to go and enter into eternity with him. But his excusers were so blind to the truth, and it was because of the hatred that they had for him. And you don't have to look very far today to find hatred today for Jesus. Jesus is probably the most hated individual on the planet today. And it is because he's telling the truth and mankind does not like the truth because truth uncovers the things that were hid by darkness. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall walk in the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, Thou bearest thy own record, therefore thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear the record myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and I know where I go. But ye cannot tell from whence I came or where I go. Ye judge after the flesh, but I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me, he bears witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my Father. For if you had known me, you surely would have known my Father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but yet no man laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. 
Then said Jesus unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, but you shall die in your sins. And where I go, you cannot go. Then the Jews said, Will he kill himself? Because he said, Where I go, you cannot go. Three things I want us to look at. First, I want you to look at the proclamation of the light of the world. Jesus here in verse 12 proclaims that he and he alone is the true light of the world. Notice it says in verse 12, This spake Jesus to them to say, I am. That's one of those I am statements. It's not that he's one of many. It's not him and Buddha and all the others. He says, I am. There's a declaration here of deity. He says, I am the light of the world. But then he makes this statement about those who truly follow him. That's what he says. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness. So if we're walking in darkness, that says something about us. Because he says here, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness. But you shall have the light of life. If he's the light of life and you've got him, you can't walk in darkness. Jesus spoke to them again. If we take this arrangement, like I said, in chronological order, I want to remind you that Jesus had already told them, I'm the water of life, the river of flowing water, and from me flows life to give to you. Why did he use bread and water and now life? Those are things that are essential to sustain us. If we were to, we can't live without water, you can't live without some kind of substance, bread, and you can't live without life. You have to have all three. And what he said here is, I have everything you need. To meet any need that you might have. I have life for you. And it comes through the water. It comes through the bread. It also comes through the fact that I am the light of the world. By the way, what happens when you don't have light? You stumble. Well, Debbie likes it dark at night so she can sleep. So the curtains are all pulled tight. And there's no light coming in whatsoever. And that works well at home because you kind of know the layout of the bedroom. But now when you're traveling, and I used to travel quite extensively, and probably, I guess, I don't know, it was probably 15 years ago, maybe 20, and we had been put into a room at a Holiday Inn, and, and so we had one of those where, as you come in, the bathroom's over here, and there's a little hallway, and there's actually a little sitting area, it has a little table and everything, and a, a sofa, it's a great place to put your laptop and work, and then it goes on into the next area, and it's, it's the bedroom. And so I was used to just having the bedroom and going right past to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and like I said, Debbie likes it dark. And so I make it to the bathroom fine, and I know that I'm coming out, I'm walking perfectly straight back to the bed, and I kind of have my hand down, so I hit the edge of the bed, and I don't know, I can sit down and lay it back down. But I actually wasn't going as straight as I thought, I was going more of an angle. And there's this wooden coffee table there, and all I know is the next moment I feel is, oh, and I'm on the floor, face down. And Debbie says, are you all right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm okay. I'd like to have a little light, but it's okay. <laughs> By the way, you went to Georgia and came back. We have our granddaughters with us. We spent a night in the hotel, and there she was, closing the curtains. And I never remember. I do. I memorized her. Okay, okay, good. I got it. You stumble in the darkness. And Jesus says, if we are walking with him, now, by the way, it doesn't mean I wasn't walking with Jesus when I fell over at the coffee table. He's talking about spiritual darkness. If I was walking in spiritual darkness, he would say, I can't be in you. Because if I was in you, you would not walk in spiritual darkness. And one of the reasons that we need him is to, for our spiritual life is to keep us spiritually in the light. William Barclay states that in connection with this passage, the, the idea of the light of the world, he says it is so intricately interwoven with the ceremony of the Feast of the Tabernacle, known as the illumination of the temple. It was a custom beginning on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles that they would light the two big candelabras in the court of the women. And that would light all of Jerusalem by the way they had them placed. And, and I love this fact here. They were celebrating the fact that for the 40 years there in the wilderness, God had provided a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He provided light for them as they journeyed, as they lived. For 40 years he took care of them until he took them into the promised land. And I do want to remind you that there is a day coming. When Jesus is going to take you and me into the promised land. He's promised us a land. It's called heaven. And there's a day coming when we will be there. But here, all night long that first night, they, they would dance and they would, would hold this festival of jubilation. Thanking God for having the light to them that they would sustain themselves until the 40 years later they finally made it into the promised land. And for some of you who've been saved for a long time. I've been saved since I was 18. And I'm 67 now. For some of you, that doesn't seem like a long time. For me, it's a long stretch. But here's what it boils down to. I don't know when he's coming back. 
But I know he is coming back. He's promised me, follow after me and I will give you eternal life. There's a land for faith. He's even got a house prepared for me. But I don't know if it's a house or a condo. But he's got a place prepared for me. He's got a place prepared for you if we're walking in the light. This was a strong and yet eloquent contrast to the darkness of those who were opposing Jesus. He's the light of the world. And so they, they brought this woman caught in adultery to try to trip him up. It shows the darkness that they were in. Anybody trying to trip up God surely is walking in darkness. And again, I love this declaration, I am. John used that over and over and over and over again to emphasize who he was. He was the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is, and that's what he's saying here again, another one, I am the light. By the way, why is it that we, we don't like the light? Well, for example, if you were to clean your house on a dim day and you didn't have the lights on, you might say, well, nobody's coming over, so I don't care. You know, there might be a few cobwebs I didn't see. And after all, I can live with that in my life. And, but if somebody comes over, you're going to turn all the lights on. you try to make sure all the cobwebs are down. You're going to try to make sure it's as clean as possible. Why is it that, that in our, our spiritual lives, we count the same way? The reason that a lot of people don't want Jesus in their hearts and in their lives is because of what he will expose to them. And they'll see the cobwebs. They'll see all the things, the impurities in their life. And if you see those impurities, you'll be convicted by the light that's within you, and you'll want to get rid of them. Well, the Pharisees and Sadducees hated Jesus so much, they didn't care what he saw in their life. And there are people today that are like it. They don't care. They live the most reprobate, most uh, reprehensible uh, lives that, that you could possibly live, and they don't care whether or not they have the light. A lot of people just don't admit it. Some don't have access to it. i got to stop teaching Sunday school. Because on Sunday school, I want to, sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a tear jerk, it's a heartbreak. And today, today was a reminder of all the, 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 the millions and well, two, over two billion people who never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to die in this eternity with Jesus because they didn't know about it. It's kind of like... You ever go to a room you haven't been in before, you're trying to find a light switch, you just not you know there's a light switch here somewhere, you just can't find it. Well, I, th I think our world's a lot like that. They're looking for truth, they just don't know where to find it. And it is our job to go and tell them. Let me just this is not part of the sermon, but give me a segue here. You know one of the things I'm excited about? We're gonna have the opportunity in February to go back to Thailand, Lord willing, and share with them again. And we'll share with people who's had little or no access to the gospel. And we have 16 already signed up, say for sure they want to go. There's four more that said they might want to go. But then, yesterday, as I'm driving back, I get a, get a text message, and there's a pastor in Henderson that I've known for many, many years. And he wants to know, do I have any space for maybe two or three, him and two or three of his church members? So we could have even 22 people go to take the good news of Jesus Christ to those who are looking for the switch. They just can't find it. You've got the switch. Those who are going on that trip, they know where to find Jesus. And we'll have that opportunity to share Jesus. So I'm excited about that. But they're lost people. Some of them don't care. Some of them don't care just how dirty their lives are. Some do care. They just haven't found it yet. And it's your responsibility and my responsibility. But notice what he says here. He says, he who follows after me shall not walk in darkness. Spurgeon said about that. He says, concern is he who follows me. He said, if a man could travel so fast as to always follow the sun, well, of course, he would always be in the light. If the day should ever come when the speed of the railway should actually equal the speed of the world's motion, then a man might live and never lose the light. However, now he who actually follows Christ will never walk in darkness. What is he saying? Man may come up with all kinds of schemes to someday avoid what we might say physical darkness, but you'll never avoid spiritual darkness. Because only if you walk with Jesus. There's no alternative. And it, well, I, I, I've got another option. No, you don't have another option. We have one option, and it's Jesus. Hebrew Scripture makes it clear that he's talking about God's Word. For example, in Psalm 119, 105, he says, Your Word, the Word of God, is a lamp to my feet, is a light unto my path. Psalm 43, 3 says, Oh, send out your light, O God, and your truth. Let them lead me. And then, of course, John 1.1, 1, 1, one of my most favorite verses in all the Bible. It talks about Jesus being the, the Son of God. And don't miss this connection. Only Jesus can keep you from walking in darkness. There are no other options. 
The second thing I want us to look at is the witness to Jesus being alive. There's been a proclamation. Jesus claims that he's the light. The, the Pharisees and Sadducees said, you're a liar. But I want you to notice what he comes back with. Verse 13, the Pharisees said unto him, Thou bearest record thyself. The record is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. Shows you how blind they were. Shows you how ignorant they were. Here's God in the flesh standing before them. He stepped out of eternity into time to tell them, I love you, I'll die on the cross for you someday very, very soon. And he did. And if you put your faith and trust in me, believe in me and the Father who sent me, you shall have eternal life. And they said, you're a liar. He said, I bear record of myself, but my record is nonetheless true. For I know where I came from and I know where I go. But you cannot tell me where I came from. Or where I go. See, they thought he was from Galilee. He wasn't from Galilee, from heaven. Galilee was just a stop along the way. Like when we go on the trip to Thailand, we're going to stop at a lot of airports. That's not our destination. When we land in Bangkok, that's not where I'm from. It's just a stopover. Galilee was just a stopover. That's all it was. You judge after the flesh, but I judge no man, meaning that man judges himself by the way he lives. And yet if I were to judge, my judgment is true, for I do not judge alone. But I am the Father who sent me. He says, you bear witness of yourself, it can't be true. Just look at the world today. And so what is happening? What is happening is everybody's making their own truth. Well, as long as your truth works for you, it's okay. But my truth works for me. Well, what happens when they're diametrically opposed to each other? Both can't be true. It can't be totally light out and totally dark out at the same exact time in the same place. It just can't be. There are some things that are true. There are some things that are absolutely true. And God's Word is one of those. Too many times we want to argue with a blind world, but we need to remember a man who sees doesn't need the light to prove itself. But a man who is blind needs the light to prove itself. Light always establishes its own claim. And here Jesus has made the claim. He says it is true. The Pharisees couldn't prove Jesus that he wasn't the Messiah that he claimed to be. They hoped to charge him with the argument to make him prove himself that he was a Messiah. When that didn't work, they wanted to, to disprove him as a witness. Jane, you're not a credible witness. And I have to admit, mankind is not a credible witness. You want a few people to testify to be sure that each one of those is telling the truth. But they're not questioning an individual that's just an individual. They're questioning God. In fact, they're actually calling him a liar. He says, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. And that will always be true of Jesus. Jesus can testify himself for one reason. He had eternity in view. And they didn't. Let me ask you a question. Do you have, you have eternity in view? We ought to live our lives knowing where we're headed. There's a day coming when you and I, as believers, will walk down the streets of heaven behind the King of kings and Lord of lords and God the Father will stand on his throne and say, be, oh my grace. Amen. And we will live with him forever and ever and ever in the fullness of all of his glory and all of his light. And they want to say to him, well, they've already called him a liar. They also said, earlier you filled with the devil. You've got a demon inside of you. I even hate to say that from the pulpit, quote scripture. I mean, that's heresy. Oh, God, the devil. He says, I know where I'm from, and I know where I'm going. And only Jesus can testify like that to himself. He says, my judgment is always true. Why? Because I'm not alone. My Father who sent me is with me, and he is a testimony that I am who I said I am. I am going back to where I said I'm going. Reminds me of that I know in whom I believe. Do you know in whom you believe? If you, if you believe that Jesus Christ really is the Messiah, that he is the light of the world, then you know in whom you believe. In verse 17 through 20, he uses God the Father as a witness to this light. He says, it is also written in your law, meaning the law of Moses, that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me is a witness of me also. Then he said to them, where is your Father? Of course, they, you know what they're actually doing here? They're going back to the fact that Joseph was not his biological father. 
And Mary would have been telling people, oh, it, this was an immaculate conception. I mean, and the, the Holy Spirit did this. And there would have been people saying, well, I don't know who Jesus' dad really was. Do you? This is a slander against the King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, so your father gives a testimony. Well, who is your father? Do you even know? That's what the Pharisees have said to you. This is a snide comment against Jesus, just to try to degrade him. But then he comes back, and he gives them even more truth. And I love the fact that it says in verse 20, and these words that Jesus spoke, why did it tell us where he spoke? It didn't really matter, but it does. He said, he spoke them in the treasury as he taught in the temple. This is where the most people could have heard it. This is where everyone was at. People even outside the temple area would be hearing this conversation that was going on. And he makes this statement. This is that no one laid hands on him. By this point, if they could have killed him, they would have killed him many times over. Because they hated him so bad. But here he is public. He's not hiding. He's not some corner somewhere saying, listen, you really need to believe in me. He's in the public of the most public place declaring, I am the light of the world. And my father sent me to tell you to put your faith and trust in me. Now here he says, it's also written that your law, I mean the law, of, the, the law of Moses, is a testimony that needs to be testified by two men. Jesus believed in the law. But he has his two witnesses. In fact, he has the two best, best witnesses there are. The only way it could be better if you, if you take the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit also testified to the fact of who he was. And I love it. It's, I am the one who bears witness of myself. That statement alone means I don't need anybody else whatsoever. And then they come back to that snide comment. So where is your father? And Jesus answered. I love the answer here. Tell the truth. You do not neither know me nor my father. For if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And Jesus spoke this in the treasury publicly to everyone. Don't forget about the Jewish leaders. They pride themselves on having knowledge of God. They, these were the educated of the day in, in Scripture. They knew Scripture. They just didn't live by Scripture. And after Jesus declares that he's the divine Son of God, Jesus tells him, you don't know me. And if you had known me, you would have known the Father. But you don't know him because you don't know me. Only an arrogant man would, would ignore the truth and still believe he knows God. But how many people today... The Gallup type poll still keep going up. People, there's still, you know, 65 to 70% of Americans say they, they believe in God. And so they, they list them as Christians. Well, look around you. Think about the people that you know. Think about the people you work with, that live in your community. The people that we, we think of the world as it is. Do we really believe that 65 to 70% of the people are really born again Christians that know God, that know the truth? Our world doesn't seem to have that testimony. But today, people are saying, oh, I know Jesus. Yeah, I, I know him. The thing is, they really don't know him. Just like the Pharisees and Sadducees. Out of everybody in this conversation, they should have known Jesus. And they should have known God. They had everything at their disposal, but they didn't know it. Now, don't you look at verse 21 and 22. Don't you look at further exposure to the leader's ignorance. They were the spiritual elite of their day, and they were ignorant of God. Then Jesus said to them, I go my way, and you shall seek me when I'm gone. But you shall die in your sins. For where I go, you cannot go. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? By the way, it would be blasphemous for him to kill himself. We'll talk about that in a moment. But here Jesus stops speaking concerning being the light of this world. He begins to talk about his world. Here he's standing on the portal, if you will, of the temple treasury, standing on the very portals of God so that everyone could clearly see that he had come down from heaven to earth. Think about it for a moment. These men, these high priests, they had offered sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, year after year after year after year, and here the eternal sacrifice is standing right before them, and they accuse him of being a liar. But I know God the Father. Tell you don't. For if you had known me, you would have known me. But we do much the same in the world today when we think about the way we treat Jesus. He says, I'm going away, but you can't go. By the way, 
Um, I have before been approached uh, by people who are a lot more Calvinistic than I am. They actually believe people, God creates some people to go to heaven for his honor and glory. God creates some people to go to hell for his honor and glory. And they use this as a thing to say predestination. God, he said, Jesus says, you cannot go. That's absolutely right. And I believe in predestination too. For you see, God has several things he's preordained. He's predestined. This world's coming to an end one day. Now, I don't know when, but he has predestined that there's a beginning of time and an end of time as far as we're concerned. And there's nothing. He has predestined a day that will be the end, the last day on earth. He's also predestined that those who put their faith and trust in his son will go to heaven. In other words, you follow my son and you will go. He's predestined that. He's also predestined that those who are not believers will go to hell. That's what he has predestined. And nobody can change it. We can have the whole world trying to pray you out of purgatory or wherever, and it's not going to work. Because only those, God's predestined some things. But this is not a passage used to, to speak to that. That's not what he's talking about. What he's doing, he said, you just called me a liar. Let me tell you what, I know where I'm going, and you can't go there. This is a point back in their face. Him saying, I am God. I have made some decisions. You don't believe in me, and it's clear by, by, the, by the terminology that you use. When you call me a heretic, when you call me a liar, you don't believe in me, and my father has set some rules down. And one of those rules is you've got to believe in me if you want to follow me. Which makes me also ask a question. If we don't follow Jesus here, what makes us think we're going to follow him there? I think it's a valid question. I have to ask myself that question. If I'm not willing to follow him here, then why in the world would I think that somehow at the very last act of my life, God's going to say, yeah, come on in. That will happen. Those who believe will follow. Those who follow will follow him there. This teaching moment by Jesus was crystal clear. If anyone followed Jesus on earth, they will follow him to heaven. Therefore, if a person has no desire to follow Jesus on earth, what on earth or beyond could ever make him think you'll follow him to heaven? And then this way it closes out. Again, they, they, they could have fell on their knees. They could have asked for forgiveness. But instead, they mock him again. Well, will he kill himself? This was slanderous insult against Jesus. Don't miss this insult. Barclay points out that the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day taught this, that the lowest level of hell was reserved for those who committed suicide. So what exactly are the Pharisees saying to him? They're saying, Jesus, as far as we're concerned, you're going to be in hell yourself and at the bottom of it if you're going to kill yourself. That's what they're accusing him of. Will he kill himself? This is slander. They never did anything but slander him. Never did they even try to compliment him on anything. Never did they try to understand what he was saying all along the way. And so what he says here is, it's not me that's going to be in hell. It's you that's going to be in hell. It's truly amazing just how ignorant mankind can be to reject truth when it's standing right in front of you. But not a lot has changed in 2,000 years. We do the same thing today. We could be reading our Bible at home, or we could be listening to a preacher on the radio, or it might be in Sunday school, it could be in church, that God convicts your heart of something. And rather than responding to Him the way we should respond to Him, and following Him, we reject Him. Now, we don't do it in quite the same manner they did, but still, they do. By the way, I find it interesting here, you know, like I said earlier, that, that light exposes the dirt that's there. And a lot of us don't want that dirt exposed. But what's the very best thing that can happen is for you to get exposed and actually clean it up. Let him clean it up. By the way, he will clean it up for you. You can't clean it up. You can't get cleaned up to come to Jesus. You just come to Jesus and let him do the work. By the way, I want to close with this. Something interesting about this word light when he says, I am the light. This word light, it makes to ignite a passion. Ignite something. And I'm convinced that when Jesus came, he says, I am the light of the world. And he that follows me will not walk in darkness, but will be the light of life. He expects you and me to ignite a passion within us from his light that we can take and share with others. 
You and I have everything that we need, not only to live our lives here and make it to heaven, and one day those things will happen for us, and praise God when they do. But until then, there are over 2 billion people that either have never heard the name of Jesus or they very rarely heard of heaven scripture in their language. I remember very clearly the first lady I met, a 65-year-old Zoramo lady, who had never, ever, ever heard the name of Jesus. When I told her why I was there, she said, who? I remember her face very clearly. And by the way, she got saved. And our missionaries that lived there for several years after that discipled her. There's still a lot of people out there that don't know Jesus. There's those who don't want to. And they have the right to, if, if, you, if you want to die and go to hell, you have that right. No one should force you to believe on Jesus. Jesus certainly would never force you to do that. You have the right to die and go to heaven. That's what, that's what you choose. But for those who have never heard, it is our responsibility. So I'm, I'm really excited about what's going to happen. I'm excited about, in September, training those 50 pastors to go back and, and make a difference in India, and then we'll go to Thailand. God's just doing, God is on the move and doing some things. And He is the light of the world. And what this world needs is the gospel saying, I died for you 2,000 years ago on the road to cross. Won't you believe in me and follow after me? And that's what we're going to go. We're going we're to teach people and share with people. And hopefully a lot of people get saved. And hopefully all those pastors that are trained, they'll go back and make a difference for the King of kings and Lord of lords. For he came to make light for everyone. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me just ask you, what is God saying to you today? Is he revealing some area of your life that you have you haven't given over to him yet? God wants every area of your life. He's not interested in your time or your intelligence or your pocketbook. He's interested in you. I remember when I finally understood that God's not interested in all these things about me. He's interested in me. It changes the way you look at things. He's interested in you. He wants all of you. Think about for just a moment. What is it he's saying to you? When 2,000 years ago he stepped out into history and he said, I'm making a way for you to live with me forever and ever and ever. And there's no other way. If you're not following after him, then you don't know him. And I can't answer that. I wish I could, I wish I could go through the audience and, and know who, who was what. I said, you, you need to do this, you need to, but I don't. But you know, because if God's convicting your heart of something, He knows what He wants you to give up or.